Hi, welcome everybody to the Career Options in Education. My name is Catalina and I'm from the Employability Team. I'd like to start this session with an acknowledgement of country. La Trobe University acknowledges that this event and our participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and value their unique contribution to the university and wider Australian society. We pay our respects to Indigenous Elders, past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to any Indigenous participant joining us online today. I'd like to welcome everybody to this session, um, and I'd like to introduce our facilitator for today, Professor Bernie Walker-Gibbs, the Associate Head of School, Learning and Teaching at La Trobe University. Thanks, Catalina, and thank you everyone for being here today. It's, it's um, I don't know, probably the one millionth Zoom session we've all had either today or in the last couple of weeks. And um, I'm really happy uh, to be um, facilitating this, but also to introduce you to our amazing panel. So I might um, hand over to you first, Camille, to introduce yourself and your role. Yep, I'm the University Engagement and International Support Coordinator at ANZ UK Education. Thank, thank you, Camille. Do you, would you like to just briefly say what you do as part of that role? Yeah, fantastic. Um, I engage with a lot of um, university students who are studying education um, to support them with um, things like job hunting, uh, what opportunities are available to you um, both locally, internationally and um, various other things. So that's um, one of the great things about my role. Thanks. Thanks, Camille. And I might go to Colin. Yeah, hi everyone, um, I'm Colin Burke. I'm the principal of Elevation Secondary College in um, Craigieburn. We're a new-ish school now. We're in our second year of operation with about 330 students in year seven and year eight. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thanks, Colin. Over to you, Roscoe. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Roscoe. I'm the International Resourcing Manager for Veritas Education. Uh, so we specialise in placing Australian and New Zealand uh, teachers in schools over in the UK, specifically England, um, and that's in early childhood, primary um, and secondary as well. Thanks, Roscoe. And um, over to you, Mark. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Mark Natoli. I'm the principal at Greenvale Secondary College, um, which, not too dissimilar to, short, uh, to, to Colin there, is a new school, but actually opens uh, next year, term one to, to year sevens. Thank you, Mark. And we're hopeful that we might have another panel member who's just running a little bit late. So when, when she arrives, we'll introduce her as well. Um, and just so you know, what, how are we going to do this today is I'm going to ask some questions and I might, and um, I will sort of uh, throw it open to specific um, panellists and then the other panelists, panel members can answer the question, but also you're able to ask questions in chat as well or put up your hand as we go along. So this is about trying to help you um, more than just me being really interested in what these these esteemed panelists actually do, which I do do want to hear. So first of all, I might go to you, Colin, in terms of um, uh, you know, can you give an overview of your career? So how did you get to where you are today, and um, what you know, so, and you know, highlighting things like what you might have studied, you know, the sorts of experiences or skills that you have, and what you need for what you do now. Sure. So, um, a small question. Yeah, just a small one. Um, so. I guess I hadn't really thought about teaching until um, I was probably about halfway through sort of senior secondary around year 10, year 11. Um, and I was sort of heading off down a path of wanting to become like an architect or, or something like that. Um, and all of my teachers had sort of pointed me and said, you're, you're actually kind of good at history and English and literature and politics. Um, maybe you should be a teacher in those areas. So um, that sort of changed my mind and direction a little bit. And I went straight to La Trobe to do an arts undergrad in history and English, um, and then straight into a one-year dip ed. So I was graduated by, um, I was 21 years old um, when I graduated from teaching. So went pretty much straight from school to uni and then back into school full time. Uh, so I was an English and humanities teacher, um, mainly for the first 10 years of my career, it was to seven to 10 students on our junior campus. Um, and that's probably where I got sort of dragged I think you could say, into um, leadership within the school. Um, so I'd never really intended to move into a leadership role or principal role. It wasn't part of the plan. Um, but a couple of years in, I became the transition coordinator. And year six to seven transition in a secondary school, at least, is a really interesting 
leadership position because you need to know everything about your school um, to be able to explain it to prospective parents and make sure that all of your incoming grade sixes have a really um, smooth transition into year seven. So I pretty quickly um, had to figure out everything about my school. Um, and I spent about eight years as a transition coordinator um, and in other leadership roles within the school before I became an assistant principal at a senior campus, campus principal at a senior campus. Um, and then to almost two years ago um, to the month, I got appointed to this opportunity, which is as um, a principal um, of a brand new school out here at Elevation. So that's, I guess, the Cook's tour of my career, Bernie. Thanks, Colin. And I might actually hand it over to Mark with the same question, given that you have similar um, job titles anyway, but I'm sure different, slightly, di slightly different roles. Yeah, thanks, Bernie. So um, probably similar to, to Colin, like if you had to ask me when I uh, finished secondary school and said, you know, you're going to be the principal of a school, let alone a teacher, I would have laughed at you and, and thought that's so far removed from what I actually thought, you know, I was going to do. And um, so my journey when I when I left secondary school, um, like a lot of young people still were a bit unsure about what I wanted to do. I went down multiple paths, um, including some applied science areas, but also into project management and construction and had a very different sort of experience um, before teaching. And in, in that world, um, I spent a lot of time working with uh, apprentices and trainees and developing um, some projects and programs in that space. And it wasn't until for me when there was an ad in the local paper one day that advertised a career change program through the Trobe Uni back then um, that I thought, you know, that might be something that would really build on the interest area that I have about working with people and, and seeing them learn uh, and, and generate new ideas themselves. So turns out that was probably the best decision I ever made and, and applied for that and got in. And um, my the teaching experience, I suppose, uh, that I've had has been, been a bit varied, um, starting at what used to be called uh, Northland Secondary College, which... Um, has now uh, has changed names, I believe, uh, and has a slightly different focus. I did a small stint at Camberwell High School, which is the polar opposite, if you like, in terms of demographic uh, and aspiration to, to what Northland had um, and ended up as well um, in the leadership roles at Sunshine College, which was a multi-campus uh, school in Western suburbs. Um, and then obviously translated now in the last, before the school I was at, I was at um, Faulkner, which as, as a principal there. Um, and then earlier this year, picked up the role uh, at Greenvale in a new school. And, and I think probably just for me, in terms of that journey, it replicates what we sort of believe in most people, not only going through uni now, but all through, through school, that your careers change multiple times across the way and, and your journey keeps evolving, you know, no matter where you are. But that's sort of like the speed dating version of, of my history, I suppose. Thanks, Martin. So given that you're experiencing the fact that you're currently, you know, putting together a new school, um, you know, can you give us a sense of the kinds of staff that you need and when you're thinking about that? So, like, one of the questions in the chat was, you know, um, Melanie said that she previously studied a certificate for in disability and would be interested in doing, you know, student support, student tutor support roles. You know, are they the sorts of things that you need to consider as well as when, when you're thinking through your school? Yeah, so I think probably more so the last... 12 to 18 months with with our COVID experiences in schools, schools have had to adapt and adjust to recognising that we're not just here for, for pure academics and education, that there is actually a side around student services, whether that be, you know, health and wellbeing, um, whether it be assistance in the classroom uh, or any of that sort of career vocational advice um, for, for people as they go through the school. So you end up recruiting and, and looking for employment opportunities that aren't just teaching uh, roles. Uh, and those experiences, um, you know, like your names from the one in the chat, are certainly uh, areas of interest 
that we often look for, um, depending on some of those specific support role functions that happen in schools. And um, I suppose that extends now into even mental health provision. Um, and, and in that sort of space where schools are now being asked to be have a wider remit than just um, you know what we do within the classroom, there's actually a stronger focus, a more holistic focus around student health and wellbeing as well. Um, I think, though, your question in terms of what we look for, if that's sort of where it started. Um, so it's quite interesting for me moving into a role where you're doing a much larger scale of, of human resource development now where we might be recruiting, you know, 15 to 20 new staff every year. And so it makes you have a, a much more of a stronger focus around um, how you select your staff and those skill sets that you're looking for. And, um, you know, part of my message in that is that the application is one bit of the puzzle. I, I know that a lot of universities spend a lot of time teaching people in your programs how to write an application and respond to selection criteria and all those types of things. But that's that's one part of it, um, that the, the experiences that you've had um, outside of that are also important, but as well as the interview process itself. And for me, um, I really enjoy seeing people who apply who've had a wide, broad experience, not just in, in, you know, going straight from school back into school, but I think that value add about any of those other things that you do along the way can often contribute quite meaningfully um, to working within a school and, and providing young people with that advice that they need, you know, from someone who's got a slightly wiser head or has been there before. Um, but the other is really, I mean, in, in my processes, we run a, what I call a group stage interview, which um, in the first stage, you, you get interviewed um, by a select group of our current staff, a bit different in a new school, um, but where we really put you through an exercise around teamwork and, and communication to identify how well you can you know, work with other people, um, sometimes that you don't really know very well, uh, and, and how you communicate effectively in that space uh, not just about the actual outcome from the task that you're doing in that group. And, and that, along with, with the applications, provides us with a good, healthy insight into a short listing process for, for individual interviews. Um, and I think probably the only other bit I'd, I'd add on there around what we look for uh, in schools is uh, it's hard, I have to say, when you're a graduate teacher to be able to draw on lots of relevant experience uh, working in a school as comparative to someone who's been there, been there before. But, you know, I think Colin would agree, don't let that deter you. Like often there are a lot of useful things and it's actually more about how you think, how you present as a person, how you communicate, but also that passion that you have for teaching. And um, none of us are here working in schools for really any other reason than we really enjoy working with young people and, um, you know, what other job do you have out there where you can celebrate and build those skills and, and you know, help other people learn and, and grow. So I'll stop talking though, Bernie, otherwise you're keeping yeah. going for it. Thanks, Mark. Um, I will get back to you about some things in a minute, but um, I might get to go to you, Roscoe. Um, and thinking through the trends that we have in education and, you know, particularly thinking about your role, you know, what do you think some of the areas of growth and demand are for are currently for education students? Um, I'd say in terms of trends for UK um, teaching, it's been pretty steady. We've, we saw a decline in the amount of uh, international students going over, obviously, with COVID and stuff, but we saw that being picked up by a number of UK applicants returning to roles for, I guess, more stable income during these COVID times. Um, but that's really starting to pick up again. So our September international placements were definitely right down. Um, but I think as people become more um, willing to travel now that, you know, with the big rollout of the vaccine and the dropping of cases over there, we're starting to see a real increase in um, teachers from Australia and New Zealand making the move over for January. So our January placements are um, starting to pick back up. Um, and I think it's just going to keep 
keep increasing there from you know January and then our April placements and then when the school year starts back again in September 22 I think you know obviously COVID's a bit of an unknown but um, with all going well I think we'll be sort of back up to where we usually were numbers wise. Thanks Roscoe and Camille I might ask the same question of you. Uh, what, have you what, what have you been noticing in terms of some of the growth and demand and possibly the impacts of COVID? Yeah great. Um, I'll, sorry, I was preparing myself to share my career progression, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> Feel free to do that as well, Camille. Sure, okay. <laughs> um, so I studied a, a Bachelor of Arts um, in History and a minor in English, and then I um, thought I was chatting to a careers um, person at, at the uni, and I was circling around teaching a lot. And so I ended up um, enrolling in a Master of Teaching and I'd actually said to the careers um, advisor, oh, what can you do with a teaching degree other than teaching? And they were, they were great, but they said, oh, nothing, you, you teach if you've got a teaching degree. I was like, oh, okay. Anyway, I finished my Master of Teaching and then promptly ended up in what I like to term teaching adjacent work. <laughs> so I haven't actually taught in the classroom, um, but I, loved the degree and um, I really value teachers and love to be able to support young um, blossoming teachers in my in the work that I do. So I um, ended up doing um, work as a writer editor for a while and then I started working with Ains UK Education um, where I've been supporting teachers um, getting into casual work or um, getting connected with my colleagues who support with um, contract and ongoing work and then I'm in my current role. Um, so this um, past 18 months, um, I suppose, we've seen that there's been um, uh, some shifts within the supply of teachers, I suppose you could call it. Um, there has have been schools that have been really struggling to um, completely staff um, their schools, particularly when teachers are off on um, sick leave and things like that. So there's been um, a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah, very high demand for teachers, which is a bit of a shift sometimes as we're in periods where um, there's, it's really hard to get the right role. But at the moment, um, there's a lot of teaching positions out there. So I would recommend um, really looking at what you're looking for in a school and finding one that's a really good fit for you. Um, so you can start out your teaching career um, in some way that's supportive, where you get behind the vision and um, you can really get stuck into the community. Uh, I hope that answered the question, Benny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, Camille. Um, you, you sort of, you've talked about this a little bit, Mark, already, but, you know, one of the things that we know um, that when principals or employers are looking at teaching graduates, they are looking for something more than the degree because everybody has a degree to be registered and um, there are certainly differences in each university and, um, and as we know, but um, in a time of COVID, when it's getting experiences are tricky to say the least, how do you recommend or, you know, graduate teachers um, get experiences that are relevant or what you're looking for in terms of, of um, a graduate teacher? And this is also, um, probably linked a bit to what Katie's asking. So she's saying, what advice would you give to pre-service teachers graduating in October? <laughs> so it's sort of a little bit linked, you know? Yeah. So what are you looking for and what do you value and how do you actually, how do you, how would you um, recommend graduate teachers get experiences that they would have normally got in volunteering, sports, other things? Yeah. Um, no, first. So uh, I suppose there's no straightforward way because every school is fairly different in, in terms of maybe how they operate and what experiences they can and, and can't provide. And COVID has certainly, from a school perspective, put the brakes on a lot of opportunities around involving community within your school. Um, so that's just not school leaders saying, no, we don't want to have people in. There's there's some certain restrictions we've got to follow. So that that does present a challenge. And, and I think the question around, you know, what's a good time to apply for teaching positions mid-year, um, I'd start now uh, because it's never such a thing as, as too early and 
um, we also recognise if you get on recruitment online, there's always schools looking for teachers, um, you know, at different times of the year, like there's move promotions that happen. So you need to fill roles or there's teachers that retire, teachers that take leave. Um, schools are always looking for good CRT pool, so replacement teachers, you know, for when people are away and, and all that sort of stuff that there's never a short you know, um, never. there's always a lot of opportunity. And I suppose that just leads into the opportunities really still are that schools still need short-term replacement staff. So registering, you know, your name and, and providing your CV to, to a set of schools so that you can get on their list around any of those short-term opportunities or, or fill-in roles is often a good way um, for a number of schools to also you know, for you to see if, if you're a fit for their school and their community, and but also for them to work with you and work out how that might look, you know, moving forward into the future. Um, I think the other with COVID, I mean, schools still have to run placement opportunities for, for um, placement students and all those sorts of things. So that's still there. Um, I don't know, Colin, can you think of other opportunities at the moment? I'm not even in school. I get to work from home for the next six months. So. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So, Colin, um, in addition to that, I think it's thinking about, so we know that there's been restrictions with COVID in terms of the kinds of experiences that, you know, um, pre-service teachers can get. But also, you know, what are the things that have come out of COVID that you've noticed that, that pre, you know, skills that maybe pre-service teachers have that previous ones might not have had that you're looking for? In, in, sure. Well, there's it. probably two parts to that. I think one is that mm. um, what everyone's concerned about around the world in Australia and particularly in Victoria is lost learning over the past 18 months. So everyone's concerned about that and it's it probably hit disadvantaged communities more than it has advantaged communities because of all sorts of things to do with, um, you know, cultural capital that families in, in higher socioeconomic mm. areas have. So the tutoring initiative that's happening within DET schools, there's a massive investment. And I don't know of a school, large or small, that's been able to fill all of their roles. Um, and so, and schools are having to be really, really creative in how they deliver that tutoring. And so I would posit that there's probably some opportunities for pre-service teachers to be contacting schools directly and saying, have you filled all of your tutoring roles? Um, is there an opportunity, you know, for me to do it? Um, you know, our tutors are doing it remotely at the moment. They're sort of sitting in online classes or they're, you know, setting up um, extra Google Meets and things like that in small groups of students. So there are still opportunities, but I think that it, it impresses principals, it impresses assistant principals, it impresses daily organisers when pre-service teachers take, um, I guess, the initiative, contact schools directly, offer some kind of value proposition about what they might be able to do because um, it gets you on the radar within a school. You won't get a response from every single one, but you might get one response and that might be a way to flesh it out. In terms of, I guess, that second part of your question, Bernie, about what, um, I guess, graduate teachers might be able to offer schools in, in a COVID response, I think it was mentioned a little bit earlier, is, I guess, um, an understanding around trauma-informed learning and that this has been essentially a traumatic experience for the world, for the country um, and for students. And even if COVID itself wasn't traumatic, the act of um, moving in and out of remote schooling so often and regularly is traumatic within itself. So I think what we're sort of noticing is that um, students without any pre-existing sort of trauma seem to be coping okay. Students that have got good supports at home seem to be coping okay. But students that have got any kind of trauma in their background, COVID appears to have compounded um, any trauma that they might have had. Um, and so having an understanding of what trauma-informed education and trauma-informed learning is like um, and how you might be able to offer something to schools in that particular area is probably a really good value proposition for, for graduate teachers. You've got the time and you've got the experts around you at the moment in the university that can help, you know, nudge you in that way to give you something that you can add into your CV and your selection criteria, whatever that might be. Thank you, Colin. And so same question to you, Camille, I guess, and probably more focusing, um, you know, about what skills or personal qualities uh, enable your, the graduates to thrive in your professional organisation. And 
I'm linking some of that to um, what um, Shinuki's talking about is it's it's about so first of all you have the skills what are you looking for and um, but also what are some other opportunities when you have a master of teaching other than teaching mm. jobs that you can look at yeah great um, so I guess some of the skills that we um, are really looking for are um, being really proficient with technology um, just mm. because that's a, a reality of today's classroom um, it was already something that everyone was moving towards um, and trying to invest in but it's accelerated in the last 18 months um, uh, I guess another thing um, would be just that versatility and adaptability um, being able to jump between uh, remote learning and in-person learning um, I mean schools are already places where anything could happen and um, you had to be able to change the plan um, pretty quickly. Um, but I think that's even more relevant now. Um, and I guess one of the other things um, links back to what you um, referenced earlier, um, people that are really wanting to get involved. Um, so getting involved in the community or um, taking on extracurricular um, responsibilities um, and things like that. We work with a lot of independent schools who are really keen on um, teachers that are open to Saturday sports and taking on different initiatives within the school as well. And um, I think you were talking about volunteering and sporting and um, community involvement and the different things that people would normally be doing and that's been disrupted the last 18 months. Um, so any previous experience with them is great to see on a CV, but also I guess any way you can continue that on by maybe being involved in a student society that um, is functioning online and being part of the um, executive of that or um, maybe yeah taking on different um, initiatives even learning new skills and it's showing interest in different areas um, is something that people have been doing in the last 18 months and that's the sort of thing you can really highlight um, maybe it's just you put that as a hobby and interest but really dig into the fact that you're actually looking to grow, you've got interests outside of the classroom and you want to bring those into the classroom to enrich the students' lives. So um, things like that um, are always great to see. And then um, in terms of opportunities outside of teaching, um, there are, of course, as I um, referred to in my um, career, uh, you can work on materials that are used within the classroom. Um, there's a lot of um, scope for curriculum writers and um, various resources. Um, I know people sometimes start incursion companies that have got teaching degrees and um, they've got something they're really passionate about and then they bring that into, into schools. Um, there's teaching opportunities outside of the traditional classroom um, through um, hospitals and um, uh, cultural centres and different things like that, um, the zoo, etc. Um, and then also you could get into a, a career in education recruitment or something like that, um, work at ANZ UK, um, or maybe a competitor. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a lot of opportunities there and it's partly just getting creative. If you um, need a break from the classroom or you're looking to um, maybe get a bit of extra experience, um, as Mark was talking about in his career, and then come to the classroom, um, maybe that's something or what, something you could consider as well. Thanks, Camille. And just because you mentioned zoos, it would be remiss of me not to remind everybody that the Phillip Island Penguin Parade is now is live again for lockdown. And so if you haven't seen that, I would thoroughly recommend it to you. Those penguins will make you smile during this time. Um, that's just personally an aside and has nothing to do with careers, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Roscoe, over to you with a similar question. Cool. Yeah, um, I think the key skills that, you know, we're looking for um, is that sort of enthusiasm and willingness to dive in. We're obviously recruiting from halfway across the world for England based teaching positions. Um, and the first step of that is, you know, uh, putting together a, a video interview at, along with your CV. We're finding that's been a real advantage. Um, talking to schools, actually being able to sort of come across um, in, a, in a video interview and then obviously a, a Zoom interview followed by that. So that's kind of the first piece to the puzzle really is being able to present yourself well, um, being confident, asking a lot of questions. Um, I mean, exactly what Camille was saying in regards to showing that you're, 
you know, technological, <laughs> you know, you're capable in the tech space um, and showing that that willingness to collaborate, I think is, is really important. Um, but getting through that, that first video interview, um, yeah, g going forward, I think just, just really being able to convey your confidence and passion for, for teaching. Um, our schools love having international students working with them. So um, if, if you're someone that's keen to, you know, make the move and, and get on a plane going over and you can kind of convey that in an interview, I think our, our schools are really keen to, to have you on board and have the resources to take on international teachers and some excellent support systems in place. Thanks, Roscoe. And this probably brings us to what, you know, um, it's fair to say, and be, before I get to that, I was remiss of me not to introduce Jacqueline Weller. So Jacqueline is also on online. Jacqueline's our Director of Professional Experience in the School of Education. So a lot of you would have either had something to do with Jacqueline, either as her role as an academic, but she has pointed out that it is Science Week and that that's very close to her heart. So I had to put that on. plug in as a STEM educator. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that, yeah, have a look online. There's a lot of a lot of resources for Science Week. Um, this is kind of, you know, the where the rubber hits the road. And I do notice that, Declan, you've um, said, are there any suburbs that we should target? You know, we tend not to want to target schools. We maybe want to work with schools. But I take your point. You know, do we, like, towards the western suburbs? And I think um, you, you've sort of addressed it a little bit um, in some of this in terms of, Camille, you talked about this um, when you were talking about, you know, pick a school that suits you and that you think that you might fit in. And um, often when we talk about where should you go and what, you know, what you should, sometimes that's about your mobility as well. Um, but what are some of the, you know, when you look at a graduate application, so it's really nice that someone like Declan goes, where can I go? What can I look at? How can I do this? But so then Declan hands in his amazing CV and his application. What are you going to look for to um, and to make it? What 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 could Declan do? I'm just looking at you personally, Declan. I know I'm talking to everybody. Um, what helps an applicant to stand out in a positive way? And I'm going to go to Colin first. Um, yeah, look, I think it, it really varies from from job to job and and sort of what we're looking for at the time. So in Mark's situation and and mine. Um, you know, we're sort of hiring between 15 and 20 teachers or, or staff a year for the next five to 10 years. So, um, you know, but what we're looking for might be different to what Mark's looking for, but also from year to year, we might be looking for different things. So, you know, as an example, we probably felt that this year, um, the teachers that we recruited, probably if they ha if we had have had maybe one extra year of experience on three or four of the teachers that we had, we would have had the perfect new teaching staff. Um, which might make us look for maybe some more experienced teachers from next year. But I think it really depends because you might look like an outstanding candidate in one school and another school might not look at you. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of you know, hidden inside the black box stuff that goes on in, in school selection. And unless you know the school and unless you have done some research and you know sort of what they're on about, you may not be able to... Um, tailor or cater your application to, to suit what they need and actually look like an outstanding candidate. So, you know, like at, just as a, a really raw example, our school is domain based. We very much believe in a, in a content rich curriculum and that's based around the traditional academic standards, science, maths, English, humanities, um, those types of things. So if your application, you might be an outstanding graduate and you might be all over inquiry based learning and project based learning, we're probably not going to look at you because that's not what we're on about as a school. So you need to know not just the educational philosophy of the school, you need to know how they do things. You need to know what type of support they give to graduate teachers, to all teachers. Um, there's a range of things and how you then tailor your application to that particular school could make you look like a standout or an also rans for one of a better phrase. Thanks, Colin. And um, I might go to you for a second, Camille, on that one. Yeah, definitely. Um, some really good points from Colin about um, making sure that you're actually able to tailor your application to that particular school. Um, so really considering yeah, their values as well and their, their, um, their whole ethos. So you can do a do it do that justice and, and get their attention. I think um, some of the things that um, 
one of the main things you really want to highlight is what you've done in your placements and and try and break that into some of the things that you've been responsible for and if you've been able to achieve anything um, really highlight that as well um, don't get stuck in the kind of the mundane parts might really use the space to get stuck into things that you've taken ownership over um, and really highlight what what year levels have you taught? Uh, what subjects have you taught? Um, different things like that that are really practical and that a school can go, oh, okay, right, you've got this experience. I can I can get that. Um, some some graduates really don't spend enough time on their placements and and or they get lost among their other work experience and things like that. So it is good to really put that front and center of of the um, the resume um, and. Highlighting those um, those things about you and those things that you're passionate about that are out, outside the classroom as well is is something that you can um, as a way you can make yourself stand out. Thanks, Camille. And so listening to both your answer and Colin's answer, you're sort of talking about um, it's really important that you demonstrate you know the context in which you know so at context matters so the you know the that you understand and have actually been respectful of the place that you're applying for the job at but at the same time demonstrating the skills that you actually have and why why would I want you as opposed to someone else so Mark what, what about from your perspective how does that sit for you yeah pretty similarly I mean I suppose the other thing is that so like this evening I'm running an information session for, for future staff and but I was just reflecting on it then, none of it is really about what I want to see in an application. Um, what I'm really doing is trying to provide as much information about the school to say this is the expectations that we have. This may or may not be, you know, the opportunity for you and, and you decide, you know, through your application. So there's, there is a two-way thing there about knowing the school um, that you're applying for and being familiar with what they expect and, and the way they operate um, because that's that's important that you know what you're getting yourself into not only around the teaching and learning and how they do that but also extracurricular opportunities um, you know the things that happen outside the classroom and the extra responsibilities that happen in the school um, the other is that I suppose with the interview and that space itself that um, people often try and say, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, but the reality is we do. And um, when you walk into the room and, and how you present, not only, you know, with what you're wearing and, and the way you talk, but also how you respond to questions and, you know, eye contact, all that interview 101 stuff, it really, really matters. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't discount any of that, especially if you, you know, practice in front of a mirror or someone else, any of those types of things. That's that often can go a long way, particularly when you may not have a huge amount of experience to draw on um, around that. And because we really want to get a view about what's this person going to look like in a classroom and, you know, can they stand on their own feet and, and present well and, and all that sort of thing. Um, the other, I think that we look for those, like a plan is great. So you can turn up with the best lesson plan, the best unit, you know, development, the best templates on the planet. Um, but the reality is in schools, um, there's no such thing as a perfect lesson. So the you need to be agile and be able to change your plan, you know, as the day flows or as the lesson goes, you know, we, we get just as much notice about translating to remote learning as what the rest of the community does. So you need to be able to pivot fairly quickly. So um, not being terribly flustered in that space is, is really quite helpful um, about being able to keep your head on your shoulders and, and being able to demonstrate that I think is a good thing. Um, someone asked, I think that just to go back to that question, maybe on, you know, any areas, I wouldn't discount either if you want to go regional or rural, um, there are so many principals that I know of, you know, um, further out than us who just can't even get anyone to apply for a teaching job um, and will accept people, um, you know, in a, in a simplified process. Whereas the closer you go to CBD Melbourne, obviously the more people there are going to be applying for jobs. So sometimes um, it's about if you're really passionate about the career path, you've got to be willing to maybe move where the work is um, to get that 
that relevant experience and that's also equally rewarding as a community um, space as well. Um, just probably the other thing on the process though, like if you go for an interview, the best thing you can possibly do if you're not successful is get some feedback. Um, and sometimes it can be quite hard to hear, but if you get a good principal or a good panel chair who's willing to give you feedback about your application, about the interview, all those types of things, it's the only way you're really gonna know what you could improve and do next. And I know from me, when people actively seek that, it sometimes almost makes me do a double take and go, actually, maybe there's more to this person um, than meets the eye. But the other is principals, are assist, it's a system level role, not just a school level role. So we'll end up talking to each other and sharing stories and, you know, we'll say, how did you go filling that job? And we'll tell them how many we got, or maybe you should look at this person. They're really good if you have the opportunity, you know, all that stuff comes up. Um, and, and we talk about those things. So, you know, I think certainly that's something to consider as well. Thank you, Mark. And so Roscoe, in your context, how much is this resonating for you or what are some of the differences that you might be looking for? Mm, yeah, I, I guess going back to my point earlier, uh, you don't you don't have the opportunity to interview in person um, because we, well, I mean, you do if you fly over, but we're encouraging students to secure a position before, they're, before they jump on a plane so that they're settled once they arrive in England. So it comes back to being able to present yourself well um, in a virtual interview. Um, and I think a, a lot of that is um, asking a lot of questions. I, what we don't like to see is teachers that sort of sit back and, you know, don't seem interested enough in the school because it's very much an interview going both ways. Um, you really want to be finding out as much as you can about the school that you're going to be working in and making sure that you're going to be a good fit just as much as um, the schools over there want to find out about yourself and your background. So I'd always come in prepared with um, a list of questions that you you want answered in, in an interview. Um, we find that, yeah, if you're, if you're showing that kind of interest, it tends to, to go a long way. So Roscoe, what, at the moment, so you're doing virtual interviews and so how hard or easy is it for someone in Australia to go overseas at the moment? Uh, you know, what are the processes that somebody would have to go through to do that? Yeah, you basically just need a job offer from uh, a school in England in terms of the, I guess, COVID travel related stuff. Um, if you've got a job offer, you're able to, you know, get on a plane and get, and get over there. Are there still, uh, are there COVID um, vaccination requirements at the moment to get into England or, do you, or where would you recommend that students keep track of all of this? How do they find out? Uh, keep track of sort of the COVID requirements. Yeah, or how, or how and when to apply for jobs, you know, overseas if they're interested in that. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously you can reach out to myself and I can <laughs> make, make you aware. Our big, mm -hmm. biggest next placement is... Um, you know, September at the beginning of the school year and then and then in January. Um, but we're in touch with our London office regularly getting updates on the situation in schools and the COVID situation. So that's, I guess, where I'm getting my information from. Um, there's some really good resources if you're looking to head over to England. A couple of really good Facebook pages that I'd highly recommend. Um, Aussies in London and Kiwis in London. Uh, just fantastic resources with a bunch of people in the same shoes that are, you know, travelling over any sort of visa queries or... Um, if you're looking to source accommodation, there's a hubs with you know 80,000 people in them, um, and there's literally not a question that you could ask that someone hasn't already asked. Um, so yeah, I'd highly recommend if it's on your radar to to make the move over. Thank, thanks, Roscoe. Um, another question, and you've, you've sort of touched on this a little bit, Mark, but, you know, like I was thinking, just trying to draw some of these threads together, you know, I think your point that in some ways teaching is a small profession in, in, in lots of ways, you know, in the sense that everybody knows everybody. And I often sort of say, you know, to pre-service teachers that someone in their group is either going to be the Minister of Education down the track or, or, or a principal or an assistant principal. So very similar to both your and Colin's um, pathways. It, it, to be a principal may not have been what you originally planned, but you know um, it, the, the reality will be that the, this group of students will come in touch with each other over many years as we do, you know, you, there's a principal's network of, and it's not drums or anything like that. It's an actual professional um, linking where you actually do talk about student, you know, potential 
um, graduates to employ and stuff like that. So, you know, one of the things I talk about often is, you know, you should really teach what you're passionate about. So like, I'm very aware um, that STEM and, you know, maths in particular, those sorts of chemistry, physics positions are very valuable. And I know in some regions, it's also like English is um, highly sought after. But um, the worst thing that I could have ever done in my career was actually become a STEM teacher because I could not, you know, one, let's, I'm a humanities visual arts girl, I'll put that out there, but to go in every day and have to teach a subject that I wasn't passionate about is not really where I wanted to be. So it's that balance between finding your profession and, but also finding and finding that fit, like, you know, we talk about going rural and regional and that's something that I'm really passionate about. But again, it's about fit as well you know like if you want to go into a regional community you're not just looking at a school you're looking at a community so thinking through those community things so when it comes back to the recruitment process you know what are the th one or two things that you wish applicants wouldn't do when they apply for a job or, or say in their interview I have a particular thing about commas and apostrophes but you know spell check you know all those sorts of things but what are some of the other things that uh and you know like i say dear mark and put the wrong school down that's probably yeah. one that I, I see a lot that happens when i look at job applications at latrobe they don't even mention latrobe they don't even know that they're applying for latrobe yeah. so, so what are one or two things from your perspective a loaded question so I have, to be, I have to be careful but i think um so uh <laughs> It's funny, everyone does it. And even my kids at home, I was helping them with resumes and stuff, you know, early on the weekend and they were trying to apply for stuff, but they didn't proofread it before they actually mm. were about to submit it. And so you named it before, the thing around um, grammatical errors and spell check and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and Microsoft Word's great on that front now that it'll just um, cover over a whole heap of stuff that doesn't actually contextually make sense. So it's really important that you get someone to proofread um, your application for you, someone who, you know, hasn't read it before because that, that tells you a lot. But so that's that's probably one of my number ones in terms of the written application space is when you get it full of spelling errors or it's addressed to the wrong people or it's got a different school name all the way throughout it, um, any of those types of things, that's, that's one. The other is I'd be mindful how many times you say, me or I. Um, so it's an interesting balancing exercise when you're writing a response to selection criteria because it is about you, you're trying to sell yourself and, and what you do, but um, you can also risk, you know, of being a bit too uh, far that way. And, and I think you try and do impress on people that as much as, you know, you're trying to improve yourself and, and what you've got to offer, you are a team player and you work with others and support and collaborate and, and build, you know, other people's capacity as well as your own, that I think that's, that balance is there. Uh, the other is in the interview thing itself, uh, I think really uh, through, through that process, um, it's always interesting, I suppose, that the, we, there's, there's so much thing, so many things that happen in schools, we don't have a lot of time to run these processes, unfortunately. So um, the time that we commit to the interview process is really privileged, important time. So if you're late or you turn up without your stuff prepared, if you're asked to prepare for a question and you give a three second response, you've probably already lost us at saying, you know, are you really interested in this or, or aren't you? And, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's just one of those things about turning up, being prepared and showing that you're willing to commit and being part of the team and, and not, we don't want to waste your time and we don't want to have the view that perhaps um, you're wasting ours either. I don't know if any of that makes sense in a nice way. No, no, I think it does, Mark. Thank you. And um, I might go to you next, Roscoe. With the same question um yeah i, I think we, we always come back to you know the, the language being clear concise and compelling with these cvs that sort of sometimes we find they can blabble on and i think and a lot of the time less can can be more of um you know if, if you're compelling i'm not by any stretch saying to be lazy and to give one sentence responses but um yeah being concise i think is and is powerful um and you're also looking for those differentiating factors um, those little 
bits that set you apart from from other people when it comes to looking at a bunch of CVs in a in a pile. Um, but yeah, I mean, all the grammatical things obviously are really really important as well. Um, having a photo on your CV is important for an international application. Um, just I guess helps schools re relate and know who they're dealing with. Um, so we always recommend um, putting a photo on. So thanks, Russell. And that's an interesting one because that's one of those ones that it, um, in other contexts, putting a photo isn't recommended. So I think it's about, that's again, when you, what we were talking about, knowing, knowing the school, knowing the context and knowing the conventions for those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, I think what you highlight when you talk about that is You've got to do the, the stuff in the inter, in the resume first before you get to the interview. So be paying attention to certain things um, gets you across the line, but then what you do in the interview, as Mark said as well, can have an impact. So Camille, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, one thing um, to bear in mind is don't use the email address that you created when you are in high school. <laughs> have something that's just simple and professional, your name at whatever.com um, and um, oh another one's slipping out of my mind but um, when you do use if you are in a situation where you do need to use a, a photo make sure that it's a professional one um, I've had some interesting ones sent through to us um, but yeah just just a professional headshot is all you need um, if you do need a photo um, oh the other one Sorry. Um, uh, that's all right, Camille. It'll probably come to you. But that, yep. the, that advice about professional photos are really important because um, it's interesting on people's profiles what, what they will actually put as a photo. And just remembering too, depending on where you're applying, there's certain cultural conventions as well about what you should be wearing and, um, you know, things like not having, um, exposing your arms and, you know, having a sleeve, having sleeves. So just be really mindful of the professional photos. And I know Roscoe, that's one of the reasons too in, in your area that that sort of stuff's important. But Colin, your advice? Yeah, mine probably follows on a little bit from Roscoe's, but it's also probably a bit different. Um, with government schools, you, as well as doing the CV, you need to write a selection criteria. Um, and that's quite important in government schools. It may not be um, needed for independent or Catholic schools, but for us, it's important. And I guess they're being clear and concise in that selection criteria is really important, but also coming back to what Camille was saying a few answers ago, that like actually providing evidence, say what you have done. Um, the worst thing, and it's a very common thing that we see from graduates is they see the selection criteria and then they just restate it like it's an essay and just that the application sort of just goes in this circle. They just sort of explain their understanding of it and don't actually tell us, well, what have you actually done on your placements? That's um, just giving us your evidence is really important and not just waffling. Um, and the last thing, and this is really, you know, um, well, one thing that will always get you on the no pile at this school is if you're right about learning styles. Um, there's been more than enough academic evidence in the past decade that's debunked learning styles. Um, and if you write about that, we'll just chuck you in the no pile. Thank you for saying that, Colin. It's nice to hear other people say that. Um, so we're at the, at the point um, where we're talking about, and this probably picks up um, your question, Chrissy. You know, Chrissy's asking about CRT opportunities and recommended agencies. Um, and um, I don't know that you can answer about the recruitment agencies and maybe Catalina, that's a question that we can follow up later on. But, you know, what are the opportunities available either at your organisation or um, around your area at the moment? So I'm going to start with you, Mark, because you've got, I don't know why I keep thinking you've got the most opportunities, but it just does actually, <laughs> just when it's new, right. it sounds like a good time for people yeah. to make a pitch to, to you. So, Mark, sure. over to you. Uh, so just so to go backwards to go forwards my statement often to people is it's a job to get a job so you know don't mm -hmm. it, it's it's a challenging process and it's a um, competitive process that's the idea behind it um the other thing is just i didn't mention it before but if you've got an open social media account that has you know uh interesting photos and things of you we will stalk you and find out about you before we offer an interview so 
you know, make sure all those kind of things. The internet's a wonderful place to find out information about people um, and you'd be surprised what you can actually find just by using Google. Um, so there's that space as well to, to consider around your own public image. Um, but with, with CRTs and, and opportunities and stuff, so the Department of Education now actually um, has a list of preferred CRT agencies that schools use. Um, so you can just Google that and, and it will come up. Um, there's about a dozen of them or thereabouts um, that are worth registering with. Um, a lot of them is more about the area that you live. So they'll try and service a group of schools, you know, in the western suburbs or in the eastern side or, or somewhere, you know, it just depends on the agency. Um, but they're all uh, equally pretty good in that space. Um, I'm probably not going to stand on here and tell you which ones that I think personally are worth, worth going with because they're their own right. But the other is those schools will often much prefer to have their own local bank of replacement teachers that, that we can use rather than going through an agency. And there's lots of reasons for that. But, um, you know, if you, if you can't just get in with an agency, it's worth trying to build a relationship with a couple of your local schools to be able to um, get on that pool because people are sick, people are on leave, you know, all those sort of things happen. Um, and, I mean, other than that, really the opportunities that come up, I know there was something that went in the chat around, you know, specific method areas or, or any of those types of things that um, I don't, I think in the last eight years in the various schools I've been in, there's always, it, it hasn't been a particular formula around one area or the other is, is hard to staff. Um, so like earlier in the year, I wouldn't have ever thought that it would have been a challenge to find a health and PE teacher ever, um, but it certainly was. And the years prior to that, it was always math, science, you know, English was the, the area that we struggled in most. Um, so even though I think there's a question here about some people have got single method areas, sometimes now that's not always um, a problem, um, depending on the school, because especially in larger schools, um, you can often have the ability uh, just to work out of one space, but you know, the fault is generally it's preferred that if you're able to teach across teaching areas and across your levels, that makes it easier for us as well. So, so Mark, just to follow on from that, it's it's also about so you know as you said that you know that your staffing profile also changes so it's it can be really difficult you know pe when people get pregnant people get sick you know people just want a bit of a break there's all sorts of reasons why your staffing profile it might shift and change you know the, the amount of students that you might have in a in, in any one year so that sort of stuff around increasing your em employment opportunities what does that actually look like for you you know how, how, how do how do we get into that black box I guess that um, Colin talked about to find out what what what's needed at the moment in your area um, well the only way is to establish relationships I suppose so um to be pretty blunt, a pre-service teacher is the best opportunity for a school to try before you buy. So um, that's, you know, a simplistic way of viewing that when we have pre-service teachers on site, you know, I'll ask people, how did they go? Do you reckon they're worth recommending for future jobs that we have up? All those types of things. And so it's important in that space to, to establish a link with the school. Um, the other is, is all the other people that you're going through the program with at the Trove at the moment, they will, you know, all go to different schools and know different people and build relationships themselves. So that network um, of teachers is important to know what's coming up. Um, but other than that, the only, the only golden ticket really is to call the school and ask uh, and, and say, what's coming up? You know, I'm interested, I'm in this space. Can you tell me a bit about the school? Can I come and have a look when that's possible? Um, you know, that it resonates quite well with me when people take a genuine interest and, and want to know about the school and it's not just a sales call. So I think that taking that time um, to invest in that space and, and know those schools and, and build a relationship with someone is probably the only way to, to find out some of those secrets you're talking about. Yeah, 
Thank you, Mark. And um, just because you're also a principal, Colin, um, which is important, um, not to say that community and loss can't, but what, from your perspective, how would you answer that question? What are the opportunities? And Yeah, very similar to the things that Mark said, um, using your professional networks that you already have, and you'd be surprised at how far your networks already stretch if you actually thought about it. Um, attending things like information nights or going on tours, as Mark said, is really important. Like I know Mark's having his tonight, but to actually go and sit and listen to what the principal has to say about the school, that can be really good. But just turning up for that, um, quite often, if we've got a really large panel and we've had, say, 30 applicants for one position, we might scroll back through the list of attendees and say, well, who, you know, who attended? And then look to see if they've actually actioned that information in there. Um, so those are really good. But I guess when you're applying, look for opportunities, because often in the job ad, it will say, you know, you can come on a, a tour or... Um, get a panel pack and the school will sometimes send you that pack and, and being able to grab hold of that. But um, I think, yeah, you'd be surprised right now at how wide your professional network is um, just with the people that are in the room at the moment or attend the lectures with you. Um, and if you're still relatively close to being out of secondary school um, or primary school, like not primary school, sorry, secondary school, call your old teachers, like call or email people. If you're only four or five years out of school, call your year 12 English teacher or your science teacher and say, hey, you know, I'm just graduating. Where should I be looking to apply? You know, you'd be surprised at um, how willing former teachers are to go to the ends of the earth to help you out with your career, even though you might be five or six years graduated from, from school. And Colin, not, not wanting to inundate you with resumes, but have you got opportunities going at, at the moment? That, or where would they, if you did, where would they find you? Where, where do you place those opportunities? Is it on the department side or elsewhere? Yeah, so the department side, but a lot of schools um, are using their Facebook sites nowadays. So um, so we're about to advertise all of our 2022 jobs um, probably this coming Friday um, on Recruitment Online, which is the department site. But we'll, you know, we'll make a big fanfare on our um, Facebook page and stick a few things up over the, the sort of the advertising period to get it as far out as possible. So... Um, you know, Mark mentioned that we do stalk candidates, um, but you should be stalking oh. schools on, on Facebook and Instagram as well, um, because a lot of schools now are, are being quite clever with their, their Facebook presences. Um, and yeah, it's a really good way to get hold of five or 600 people to have a look at your ad that might not know there are opportunities in your school otherwise. Thanks, Colin. It's good to know you, it's Facebook goes both ways mm. and you know that is that's really good advice and that's fairly new advice I think you know because mostly we would always refer students to recruitment online as well but I think it's really important that um, pre-service teachers are aware of those opportunities. Camille what about in your organisation or you know are there any opportunities? Yeah of course um, definitely uh, so we um, are somewhat unique in the breadth of the opportunities that we can actually support with um, so we do have um, casual relief all across Melbourne, Geelong, out into Gippsland. Um, so we cover a very large area um, and that's in early childhood, primary and secondary and special education. Um, and we also support um, independent schools in Melbourne with um, contract and ongoing positions. And we also support regional Victorian schools with um, contract and ongoing positions as well. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities locally. Um, and you can yeah, reach out to us if you want any support with, with any of that. We, um, we're based interstate as well, particularly in um, New South Wales. Um, and then we have opportunities to teach in um, the UK, in England and Wales, in New Zealand, um, on the North and South Island, and in America, in um, California, Nevada, Texas and Colorado. Thanks, Camille. And Roscoe? Yeah, so um, we've got a, a range of opportunities, um, but the bulk of them being in and around London, but also some opportunities up north, Manchester, Preston and Leeds as well. Um, our roles uh, range in, in length, so anything from as short as, you know, a term or two terms, to one year to permanent. Um, I'd say the average sort of length of an international placement is like a 12-month fixed term contract. And we find that often what happens is our teachers that are going over on typically a two-year working visa, um, take a one-year fixed-term contract, and then at the end of that, um, often what happens is this, the teacher ends up staying there for another year um, if both both parties are happy. Um, we've got a range of jobs that are up live on our website, but 
I'd certainly recommend reaching out um, to myself or I've got a colleague, Fiona, that's based in Melbourne um, and we'll be able to give you kind of update, up-to-date um, vacancies and I guess tailor it more to your needs and uh, your subject area. Thanks, Roscoe. And just before I um, close off, I just there was a question from Michaela and maybe Colin or Mark, you can answer, saying that on recruitment on online, sometimes the school will advertise, for example, graduate teacher program maths. Um, however, there are three separate links. What should they do? Should they apply for all of them or just choose one? Always apply for all. Yeah. If there's three jobs that look similar, always apply for all. And the other thing is quite often graduate teachers might think they're only allowed to apply for jobs that are labelled as graduate. And that's not the case. You can apply for any, any teacher job. Um, and that's a really important thing. Don't just limit yourself to the graduate jobs. Thanks, Colin. So really, um, I think we're through the questions, Catalina, but I might just ask each of you to maybe if you've got a final comment that you'd like to make, make and I'll start with you, Camille. Um, what I forgot to say before was relevance. So with your CV, um, definitely structure it based on relevance. What are the, the key things that you need to put in front of the person reading it? Um, from the get-go. Um, so the fact that you've got a teaching qualification, your placements um, and your personal information are the, the key things to be front and centre. Um, and then also with the content, um, you're applying for an education role. So everything that you are, are listing, put it through that lens. So other roles that you've held in different industries, focus on the skills that you've developed in those roles that make you a better educator now, rather than talking about the the nitty gritty of what you the tasks that you did there. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Camille. Mark. Um, so uh, I suppose the uh, I, I mean I mirror what Camille just said there in terms of your application. Like if we end up getting quite a number of people apply for a position. Um, you know, it's, it can become a bit of a challenge sometimes to sit there over a, a day and, and read through so many. So you want to be able to create the narrative and the opportunity for yours to stand out comparatively to others. Um, I think the other space, though, uh, you know, is, is knowing the school, just to refresh what Colin was saying, that, you know, I don't have one yet, a website or anything, but in terms of schools don't have websites and Facebook pages and all that sort of information that we put up there just because we like to. Um, it's actually there to provide useful information to the community, including prospective people who would like to work there. Um, and often when we read through the applications and we talk with people in the interview, if we can hear some of those things coming out that makes it show that you've researched the school and you know about it and you've individualised your response that's that can go a long way um, and probably the only other thing is that the selection criteria response for for government schools um, there are, there's normally five or six standard selection criteria for every teaching job and that's that's fine but again if you don't change the name of the school every time you submit to a different school you're going to get caught out but the other is that more often than not, what we'll all do is add a local criteria. So another one that's just, you know, localised to our context that you need to respond to. Um, and I suppose just the thing for me is that if, we, if I have 80 people apply for a job and you haven't responded to that criteria, chances are we'll just won't read it then. Um, so that stuff that's on recruitment online, it's, it's important to read through that and not just think they're all the same, um, just at different schools. Thank you, Mark. And Roscoe? Yeah, I guess one thing I sort of haven't really touched too much on is uh, just the whole teaching abroad thing. I'm, I'm a teacher myself who sort of returned home after two years teaching abroad. So I just wanted to I guess, throw it out there that if anyone you know wants to have a, have a casual chat around um, what my experience was like teaching over there, I'm more than happy to, happy to offer that. And I, I feel like teaching abroad is a great way, um, you know, when you get out of university to go overseas and to try... A bunch of things and um, before you come back home and, and settle into a, a position so I certainly love my time over there and I'm, I'm just keen to you know pass on any information and help other people that might want to um, go down that path. Thanks Roscoe and Colin? Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is um, well done because you've chosen the best job um, because teaching and education it really is the best career um, and you can take it in so many different directions. 
um, and you'll probably never have a boring day. And if you do, um, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, but um, yeah, I guess whatever whatever path you choose and sort of wherever you end up, I guess you may not end up in your perfect or dream job straight away, but anything you do in whichever direction you go out of uni, it's going to actually build a unique set of skills and experiences that will help shape you into a career-long professional that's different to everyone else. So um, whatever you're doing at that time, whichever job you get straight out of uni or in five years or, or 10 years time, it's actually building you into a long-term really employable um, prospect. So um, I guess that would be the last thing I'd sort of say. Thank you, Colin. And um, Catalina, I've actually managed to wrangle it on time. I don't know if you realise that. Um, but I, I just personally wanted to thank both Camille, Mark, Roscoe and Colin. Um, when we do this work, we can't do any of this work without people like yourselves that are willing to come and talk to the students and, and also Jacqueline behind the scenes who is very passionate about this. So um, I, I think that's it from me, Catalina. So I don't know whether you formally finish this or where we go to from here, but I've certainly found this interesting and thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Benny, for facilitating the session. And just a reminder to all the La Trobe students, we do have career counsellors that can help you look at your CVs and your selection criteria. So if you do, do need help with proofreading um, or you don't know how to structure your CD or resume, do get in touch with the Career Ready team. Um, and yeah, and just look out for more events. We have an upcoming event for our regional students, which is this Thursday at 12 o'clock. So that was in the same email that was sent to you through Career Hub. So please register for that. We have a, um, a board of panelists for that as well. So, um, and just after the session, I will be emailing the recording to all the students. So if you have come in late, don't worry, you can um, watch it on YouTube um, tonight. So I'll be sending that through this afternoon. But thank you so much again to all the panelists and thank you, Bernie, for facilitating such a great session. And thanks to all the students for coming in today so um yeah so have, take care stay safe and we'll see you hopefully this thursday good luck everyone <laughs>